What an extraordinary picture is painted for us in the opening verses of our gospel reading. Jesus, the now famous teacher and healer, has gathered a huge following. People have come from miles to see him, not quite as far as Australia, but they've come from miles to see him, looking to be healed and cured of all sorts of conditions. He would have looked on the crowd with great compassion, with deep longing, and willingness to meet their obvious needs. And we read that he healed them all. If our readings stop there, we may well get the impression that ultimately God offers us a get out of suffering free card. Well, of course, we know from experience that that simply isn't true. But to grasp the significance and the context of what Jesus went on to say, we need to take a quick look at the culture of the time. The land was occupied and subdued by Roman invaders. Crucifixion was a common occurrence, basically saying, this is what we do to terrorists. Just think of him saying in that context, those who weep now will laugh. What an extraordinary message to bring in the context of such brutality. Maybe some of his listeners would have said, dream on. Perhaps the nearest comparison in modern times, though, without the extreme barbarism, is the invasion and subsequent annexation of the Crimean Peninsula from the Ukraine, which happened in 2014, and now the possible invasion of the Ukraine by Russia. Not good. So Jesus, having brought healness and wholeness to so many, didn't stop there. He hadn't yet finished with the crowd. And we see in our, in our reading today that he was not only interested in their external needs, but their internal needs, their hidden needs, their secret needs, the real them. And I believe he has the same interest in us today, the real me, the real you. And in verses 20 to 22, he addresses our struggles head on. His first point, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, may look as if it's still addressing the external. But if we look at Matthew's take, he helpfully opens it up with, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. So what does that actually mean? Well, it refers to an attitude of humility, a recognition of spiritual poverty, where we acknowledge our shortcomings and the need for God himself as our source of strength and comfort. It can be accompanied by a sense of weakness, emptiness and vulnerability. Did Jesus really understand or experience that sort of thing? Well, yes, he did. Because prior to our reading today, we read that he saw that he needed to spend a night in prayer with his father in order to be equipped what the father intended him to be and what the father intended him to do. So do you ever feel poor in spirit? I do. And I believe that God loves us so much that he will use our shortcomings our anxiety, our sense of inadequacy to draw us close to him in friendship and relationship. That place of utter dependence on him. Yes, that's what he really wants. It's a pleasure for him, not a chore. That's what he really wants. And in Matthew 11, we read that Jesus makes that great and wonderful invitation. Come to me, all you, are, you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. And he's still saying it to us today. I see this first beatitude or blessing as our invitation and welcome to the amazing upside down kingdom of God. 
Our emptiness makes room for the divine, the someone, the other, the friend, the father, the comforter. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. The Apostle Paul got it. He got what it meant to be poor in spirit when in his second letter to the Corinthians he talks about his thorn in the flesh. He writes, Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That is why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardship, the persecutions and the trouble that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If we look at the other blessings mentioned in our reading today, it's clear to me, I believe they all depend on the first one. So we read, blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. In verses 23 to 27, Jesus continues to point us to God's kingdom by contrasting it with the kingdom of this world, where self-sufficiency, self-satisfaction, and self-importance will never cut it. Jesus was more than likely to have been aware of our Jeremiah reading this morning, where it talks about the tree planted by streams of water, also mentioned in Psalm 1. And he may also have been aware of the verse in 2 Kings 19 and that little verse in Isaiah 37. And yes, I'll tell you what it is. It's of that simple yet profound metaphor of a plant in relation to how we are encouraged to live in God. We read that in order to bear fruit upwards, which is seen, we have to have roots downwards which are hidden. And we get a number of references in Scripture to this principle. We read about being rooted and grounded in love, rooted and built up in Christ, and bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Ruthie and I have several plants around the house. Most have survived, and some haven't, often because they haven't been watered. So how do we keep our root system healthy? Well, it's by maintaining our relationship with God 24-7. Prayer is helpful. It's a conversation with God. One of our bishops has said about prayer, if you want to pray and don't know what to say, just say thank you. It's a great start. And many of you here may remember when some years ago Flo Rowland stood up in front of us and said, well, I talk to God while I'm doing the washing up. In him we live and move and have our being. We can't get away from him. He reads our thoughts. He hears about our longings and our needs and our anxieties and our joys and our sorrows. He's listening in all the time. And I believe we worship a talkative God so we need to be listening in too. And this is going to strengthen our root system, that which is hidden, the real me, the real you. So again, Paul gives the Philippians some great advice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what is God after in all of this? Well, his desire is to work in us and through us to be able to bring good news to a broken world. That's what he wants. So we are called to be a people of life 
a people of hope. And so as we continue our journey as followers of Christ and endeavour to seek and experience the truth of the words of Jesus, may we all become aware of God's active presence in our lives and the power of unconditional love. And then we will experience what C.S. Lewis described as surprised by joy. May it be so. Amen.